Make no mistake, a packed auditorium does not mean you have revival. You can fill an auditorium with enthusiastic people who sing and dance. So can Shatawale. You can fill an auditorium with people who wave their hankies and cheer. So can black stars. Entertainers, athletes, political figures can fill places with people shouting and screaming. But revival centers around Jesus. Revival is not about a man of God. Revival is not an event. You see some churches, three-day revival. Revival ends on Friday. Revival ends on Friday. If it's revival, it doesn't end. Tell your neighbor he's talking about you. On April 2nd, 2004, 14-year-old Gina De Jesus was walking home from school. At around 3 p.m., she stopped to talk to her friend Arlene. They chatted for a while, and then Arlene left her. Arlene thought Gina was going home, but Gina never reached home. In fact, Gina was not seen again. She simply disappeared. What happened to Gina de Jesus? Did she run away from home? Was she kidnapped? God forbid, was she killed? Her family sought for her frantically, but there had been no witness to what happened to her. The family rushed to the police. The police searched for witnesses, but there was no witness. So the police said, we don't know where to look. We don't know who to ask. We can't investigate because without a witness, there is nothing we can do. Without a witness, no one knew what happened to Gina De Jesus. Without a witness, the police could not investigate. Without a witness, there was no information to guide them to deliver Gina. Without a witness, people gave up and forgot about Gina De Jesus. What they didn't know was that Gina had not run away. Gina was not dead. In fact, she had been kidnapped off the street by a wicked man named Ariel Castro. And for nine years, for nine years, Ariel Castro held Gina de Jesus in his house. He tied her up and locked her up and used her as a sex slave. He never allowed her to leave the house. He forced her to do the unthinkable. Had a witness seen Ariel Castro kidnap Gina, police could have gone to investigate. Had a witness seen Gina go into the house, police could have gone and rescued her. Had a witness been there, something could have been done. But there was no witness. So she was locked up for nine years. Gina de Jesus eventually escaped in 2013. When one day Ariel Castro forgot to lock the door, keeping her inside. But Gina had to endure nine years of torture because there was no witness. The tragic story of Gina de Jesus has a message for all of us today. But you see, in her story, we understand the power of a witness. Gina lost nine years of her life, but there's something worse today. Today there are millions of people who are losing eternal life because there is no witness. They're kidnapped by the devil. They're held captive against their will. They're locked up and chained up in sin and in torment, and there is no witness. Jesus Christ died for everyone. Jesus' blood is enough to rescue every man and every woman. The Bible says he tasted death for every man. He shed his blood so that all could be saved and delivered from the hand of the devil. But millions of people are still held captive because there is no witness. 
No one comes to rescue them. No one brings them life. No one brings them love. There is no witness. Without a witness, they cannot know. Without a witness, they cannot believe. Without a witness, they cannot be saved. For Romans 10, 14, and 15 says, can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how can someone tell them unless they are sent. Simply put, there are multitudes of people around the world that cannot be saved. Though the blood was shed to rescue them, they cannot be saved. Right now, they cannot be saved because they don't believe in Jesus. And they can't believe in Jesus because they've never heard of Jesus. And they cannot hear about him because there is no witness. But this situation doesn't need to continue. In fact, Jesus has given us the promise of the Holy Spirit. He's anointed us and called us and empowered us. He wants to set us ablaze so that we will go into all the world and preach the gospel. He sent us out to be his witnesses. For first comes the Holy Ghost, and then comes the power, and then comes the witness to all the world. So let's take a few minutes this morning and discover the purpose of being ablaze. Let's understand today that God has sent the Spirit and sent the power to set us ablaze that we might be His witness. Almighty and everlasting Father, help us today. Lord, give us a burden that makes us weep for the multitudes in the villages who've never heard, for those bound by Islam who don't know Jesus, for those who are in torment of sin, struggling with addictions and lust and pornography and drugs and alcohol and crime. Lord, give us a burden for them today. Open our eyes and see that there's a purpose that you've sent your spirit. There's a purpose that you've sent your power. There's a purpose that you've sent your fire. There's a purpose that you want us to be ablaze, that we might be your witnesses in all the world. Stir us today. We submit to you now. I bind every voice of the devil that would come to deceive or disturb or distract us. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I loose the power of the Holy Spirit, the power to give us light and life and love, the power to make us a witness for your glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. I invite you to join your faith with me right now. Put your hand on your chest and pray after me. Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome once again to Ablaze. I'm so blessed to be here with you today at this final day of our Ablaze conference. Hasn't it been great? I tell you, I've been stirred. I'm set on fire. I'm ready to go. And God is still doing something on this day. We're going to be praying for each and every one of you this afternoon. It's going to be awesome explosion of power. Tell your neighbor, explosion of power. God laid it on my heart to organize these conferences for the pastors and church leaders. Uh, every year we have a blaze. This is our spiritual renewal, revival, and prayer conference. In October we have LEAD. Everybody say LEAD. Uh, that's our teaching conference. We gather you once again to teach you the best practices to grow and develop your church. But I believe today God's Spirit is speaking to us about His power to set us ablaze. I know that God God is moving in our midst. You see, we are the heirs of the first church. We are the ones who are following in the path of those apostles who received the outpouring of Pentecost. We are the ones who are the recipients of the great move of God that has birthed the New Testament church. And we dare not drop the baton. We dare not fail in our calling, for all of heaven is watching and cheering for us. And I'm so grateful for the men of God who've come Reverend Guy Pei, Pastor James Alateran, Pastor Ebenezer Day, Prophet David Ruff. Give them a big round of applause. They have taught us 
And they have imparted to us something that has set our hearts on fire. But listen to me well, my friend. Revival is never just a personal issue between you and God. True revival starts with you connecting to Jesus. But true revival also results in a renewed zeal to go to the darkest corners of the world and bring the light. True revival moves us to commit ourselves to bring hope to the hopeless. And if you experience personal revival at a blaze, it will result in powerful results in the world around you. For the fact is God has a purpose in setting you ablaze. He didn't set you ablaze just so you feel good. He didn't set you ablaze just so that you could have a powerful ministry and attract people and get their tithes and offerings. He set you ablaze to reach the lost, to heal the brokenhearted, to rescue the captive, and to be a witness for his glory. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's the truth we're going to discover this morning in our sermon, ablaze for a purpose. Tell your neighbor I'm ablaze for a purpose. To help you learn the truth, we printed sermon notes. They look like this. Go ahead and take them out and follow along as we look at our scripture text found in Acts 16, 22 to 28, the story of Paul and Silas in jail. And in their story, we're going to discover three truths about being ablaze for purpose. Let me give you some historical context. Paul and Silas had gone to the city of Philippi to preach the gospel. When they were there, God moved mightily. There was a revival fire. There was a blaze all in the city. People were being saved. Demons were being cast out. Somebody say amen. And because of that, they faced great persecution. Oh. How many of you love to claim the promise of God? If you love to claim the promise of God, raise your hand. You know a promise of God? All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. See, I claim it in Jesus' name. Oh, some of you kept quiet. Oh, hey, hey, I'm watching you. Let's listen to the word of God. Now receive the word of the Lord. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Hey! And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Hey. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to your heart today in Jesus' name. I don't know about you, but this is one of my favorite stories about Paul. And at the same time, it's one of those stories that makes me marvel and wonder. After all, these men were beaten. They were stripped. They were thrown into prison. Yet in the midst of their trial, they kept faith alive. They remained ablaze for the glory of God. And because they kept loving Jesus and stayed ablaze, God shook the prison. And that's story can give us three truths about being ablaze for God. So let's break it down and see how we can be changed so we can change the world. Here's your first truth today. Now is the right time to be ablaze. Everybody say now. Now is the right time to be ablaze. Verse 23 and 24 says, after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Then verse 25 says, it was about midnight. So here are these two men of God thrown into the deepest dungeon. Their backs are bloody and bruised. Their feet are fastened with shackles. It was midnight in the prison of despair. You know what? It's easy to be ablaze when things are going your way. Hey, 
way. When you come on Sunday and every seat is full, you feel a blaze. When you're preaching and people stand and shout amen, you feel a blaze. When the offering is double the week before, you feel a blaze. When people are calling you for prayer, you feel a blaze. When things are moving well, you feel a blaze. But how can you feel a blaze when you're in the deepest dungeon at the midnight hour? But the fact is there was no place deeper in the dungeon, no place darker than midnight, no place more discouraging, more depressing, more hopeless than where Paul and Silas found them. Yet here in their worst condition, the fire was still burning. They were singing praise to God. They were worshiping. And in their example, we learn a lesson. Revival is not dependent on what you see. Revival is not dependent on your circumstances. Revival is not dependent on your situation. Revival is based on who God is and what he's promised. And even in the midst of darkness, even in your village, even in your church, even when it doesn't look as if God is moving, you can still be ablaze for God when you bring the presence of Jesus into your midst. That's what the great Jewish leader Ezra discovered. Listen to his words in Ezra 9.9. We were slaves. Oh, slaves. But in his unfailing love, our God did not abandon us in our slavery. Instead, he caused the king of Persia to treat us favorably. He revived us. Uh, he revived us. Somebody say he revived us. So that we could rebuild the temple of our God and repair its ruins. And I'm here to tell you today, no matter what you're facing... No matter the discouragement, no matter the midnight hour, no matter the depression or the dungeon you're in, there is a God who has mercy. There is a God who loves you. He is locating you right now to lift you up and send you to be his witness. If you believe it, say amen. amen. No matter how bleak or barren, God's love never fails. You may be facing challenges, but he is setting you ablaze for a purpose. Your finance doesn't prevent the fire. Your membership doesn't prevent the fire. Your difficulty at home doesn't prevent the fire. You can be in a dungeon at midnight and still be on fire for God. You can be in a lion's den and still be on fire for God. You can be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. But there is a fourth man standing there with you. He's in the room, and he's there. If you believe it, say amen. amen. That's why David cried out in Psalm 119, Remember your promise to me. It is my only hope. Your promise revives me. Your promise brings revival. Your promise brings revival. It comforts me in all my troubles. And I'm here to tell you today, we expect revival not based on our circumstances. We expect revival because of who God is and what God has promised. Our God never changes. For Hebrews 13.8 says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the God who sent down the Holy Ghost uh, in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. He's still the same He's got the same power, the same fire, the same Holy Ghost. Somebody shout hallelujah. For the sovereignty of God never changes. And because he's sovereign, God can do amazing things in spite of bad circumstances, in spite of difficulties and challenges. We can rejoice in hope because God's power is greater than every power of darkness. That's the lesson we can learn from a man named Samuel from Upper East Region. Sam was from a village called Sawaliga. Growing up in Sawaliga, he had never heard the name of Jesus. There was no church, no gospel. There was only darkness and poverty. So when he was a youth, he decided to go to Accra to make money. Hey! He went to Accra, he started working, he got money, but he also made a more important discovery. For the first time in his life, he heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. 
Then after 20 years being away from Sawalika, he decided to go home and share the gospel with his people. So he packed his wife and children and they went back to Sawalika. But when he began to share the gospel with his people, he met resistance. In fact, the chief ordered him not to preach. He did not give him permission to start a church or win others to Jesus. And the persecution increased, increased, increased until finally the chief exiled Samuel and his family family from Sawaliga, and they had to flee the town. After all those years praying for his people, looking forward to going home, suddenly there was just disappointment. It seemed there was no hope to bring a church to Sawaliga. But disappointment could not quench Samuel's fire. Finding refuge in God and a nearby village, he continued praying that God would send missionaries to his village. He continued to pray that God would raise up a church and raise up a witness for his glory. It took years of faith hidden away in another town, but Samuel saw the answer. In 2016, God sent a team from Agape Gospel Mission from this church here in East Legon, and we went to preach the gospel and plant a church. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we planted a church in that town, and 200 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ. Suddenly, a church was born. Samuel was welcomed back home, and he became an elder in the church we planted in 2016. When all hope was lost, when it seemed like there was no way, he looked to Jesus Christ and kept the fire of revival alive. And today his dream has come to pass. There's a thriving church in Sawaliga because the power of God is not dependent on circumstances. The power of God is not dependent on what you see. The power of God is based on who he is and the promise he brings. Somebody shout power. Power. And in Samuel's story, there's a lesson for all of us. God can turn even the darkest tragedy into a powerful triumph. That's why I believe this is the right time now for revival. Things look bad in the world. Hey, I went to U.S. for some time. I came back. Everything has become dear. Hey, the city has devalued. The prices have gone higher. Or is it only me? Our economy is shaken. I read today on Ghana Web that they're expecting three weeks doomsor. The pipeline from Nigeria has maintenance and repair. That's what they said. And we should expect light out. <sighs> Things look bad. People are running after money, looking any way to get a visa. People are struggling to get ahead, even turning to criminal activity. People are in darkness, seeking basic things of life. Yet God's people must not despair. We must not lose hope. For the fact is, these desperate times can also pave the way for revival. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. Listen to his words. We think you ought to know. Tell your neighbor you ought to know. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. Hey, already? We thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. Abba. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on God who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. We've placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. And listen to what Paul is telling us. When things look bleak, it's not a problem. He's teaching you not to rely on yourself, but to rely upon him. When the CD is in free fall, don't panic. You don't need to worry. You're not trusting in the CD. You're trusting in God. When there are no jobs in Ghana, don't worry. You're trusting in God. When things are difficult and days are dark, we're trusting in God. For great hope grows out of great hardship, and difficult days are fertile ground for revival. We pray for peace. We pray for prosperity. We pray for protection and the power to live good lives. And all of those things are good. But if peace and prosperity turns our hearts away from God 
and bring spiritual darkness, then may God take those from us and give us the circumstances that make us desperate for him. Have you ever noticed something funny? Sometimes someone will come to church, say, Pastor, I'm sick, pray for me. You pray for them, they get healed. That's the last time you see them in church. Sorry, don't, don't misunderstand me. I believe in healing. I believe in power. I believe in deliverance. God will do it all. But if being sick makes me in the arms of Jesus and being whole makes me a sinner on my way to hell, let me be sick. I rebuke sickness from my life in the name of Jesus. I don't receive it. But may God give us a hunger for the eternal. We have become so carnal in the church. We become so carnal in the church. When you say, I release blessings upon you, everybody shouts. If you say, I release holiness upon you, hmm. I release visa upon you, everybody shouts, hey, I receive it. I release spiritual fervor upon you, hmm. Some of you are going through trials because God's trying to get your attention. He's knocking on your door. Sorry, this may not be popular. You may not like me. Don't worry, James and, and Guy and, and uh, Ebenezer, they're coming. But for a minute, let me talk to you like a father. Because sometimes a father will spank you. Eh? Sorry, sorry, don't be offended. But daddy's coming to spank you today. Some of you are in the position you're in because you're not seeking God. And God's trying to get your attention. He's knocking on your door. Wake up and look at me. I want you to come to me. That's the lesson we can learn from a woman named Janelle Guzman. Janelle was in her office at the World Trade Center in New York City on September 11th, 2001. Suddenly, a hijacked plane slammed into the building. The explosion sent a ball of fire and smoke throughout the offices. Inside the building, walls collapsed, windows shattered, and the building shook. Janelle and her co-workers were panicking. They didn't know what to do. They started grabbing their things and running. The elevators weren't working, so they began to walk down the stairs. But Janelle and her colleagues uh, were on the 64th floor, and it took them time to come down. And before they could reach the bottom, suddenly the building collapsed. Concrete was flying. Metal rods were flying. And Janelle began falling, 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 until she hit the ground in the darkness. Miraculously, she landed in a space where she was not crushed and where she could breathe. Her leg was trapped under a metal beam. Her head was caught between stacks of wreckage, yet somehow there she was alive in the rubble. For one full day, Janelle lay wounded and trapped in the rubble. And there she started to pray. She had been raised a Roman Catholic. For the past three years, she'd put religion on the self shelf. She was into the glitz and the glamour. Listen to her words. I was into the glitz and glamour, Janelle says, but trapped in the darkness, her thoughts began to turn to God. Suddenly, all the pleasures of this world seemed meaningless. Other people's opinions didn't matter. Buried in the darkness with her life ebbing away, her only focus was on Jesus. I was praying to God, God, please save me. God, give me a second chance. I promise I will change my life and do your will. She re now remembers saying that prayer over and over. She had no idea how many times she prayed or how many hours passed. But shortly after noon on Wednesday, September 11th, Janelle heard voices. She screamed as loud as she could, Hey, hey, I'm here, I'm here, I'm alive. Help me, help me. A rescue worker responded and searchers began to dig. They pulled back the concrete and the metal, and Janelle reached her hand through a crack, and suddenly another rescue worker grabbed her hand. Janelle felt the touch of someone who'd come to rescue her. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> Janelle Guzman had been rescued. In fact, she was the last survivor pulled from the wreckage of the World Trade Center in New York City on 
But when Janelle was rescued, she was not only delivered from the rubble and the concrete, uh, more importantly, she was delivered from sin and a futile life that was worthless. For in the darkness of her desperation, Janelle surrendered to Jesus, and the worst day of her life became the best day of her life when she met Jesus. Today, Janelle Guzman is devoted to Jesus Christ. Instead of chasing the temporary pleasures of this world, she volunteers in her church and helps others uh, to overcome their problems. She tells them about how God rescued her from the Twin Towers. She tells them about her prayers. She tells them about the power of God. She tells them how her worst day became her best day when she met Jesus. And if Janelle were here with us today, she would tell you the same thing. No matter how dark it is, no matter how deep you're buried, no matter what has happened to you, your worst day can become your best day when you see Jesus. So don't fix your eyes on the earthly. Fix your eyes on the eternal. For when we loosen our hold of this world, we grab hold of what really matters. And that's what happened to Paul and Silas. They could sing in the prison because they were not focused on their shackles. They were focused on their Savior. They could sing because they weren't looking at their difficulties. They were looking at their deliverance. This is the right time to proclaim Jesus Christ. People are confused. People are hopeless. People are helpless. There's darkness. But we must take this gospel and be a witness. For Jesus Christ says in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Every nation will hear. Every tribe will hear. Every village in Ghana will be reached. Everyone will know that Jesus is the answer. Everyone will hear because we are a blessing and we are going forth. Jesus is still saving. He's still healing. He's still delivering people. And that brings us to our second truth today. Jesus is the reason to be ablaze. Look at page two in the middle there and understand that we can understand Jesus Christ is the reason to be ablaze. Listen to verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They knew the reason for their revival was the person of Jesus Christ. They didn't place their hope in man. They weren't trying to change politics. They didn't hire a lawyer. They put their hope in Jesus Christ. Uh, For Matthew 12, 21 says, his name will be the hope of all the world. And I'm here to declare to you today that Jesus is still the hope. The answer's not in NPP or NDC or CPP or any other PP. The answer is in Jesus. Jesus. The answer's not in IMF loans, it's in Jesus. The answer's not in a visa to America, it's in Jesus. The answer is getting close to him, for all the hope of the world is temporary. But Jesus is eternal hope. For Ephesians 2.12 says, in those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. You see, without Jesus, there's no hope. You can have all the money in the world. You can be a a, a, a rich man in East Legon with a mansion. Have you seen some of the mansions? Cars. You can have cars. You can have everything. But without Jesus, you have no hope. There's no future. There's no life. Anything you put your hope in in this world will fade away. And if the only hope you have is this life, it's futile. That's the lesson we can learn from what happened to Emirates flight in January last year. On January 27th at 10.30, Emirates flight EK448 took off from Dubai, headed to Auckland, New Zealand. But halfway through the 9,000-mile flight, the plane was forced to return to Dubai. Why? They got a call on the radio from Auckland Airport that said there had been heavy rain, the airport was flooded, and they had closed Auckland Airport. So the Emirates flight turned around in the middle of the air and went back to Dubai. They spent 13 hours in the air, flying the passengers nowhere. 
They took off from Dubai, spent 13 hours flying, and landed back at Dubai exactly where they started. Oh. During the flight, passengers ate and drank. Hey. During the flight, they chatted with their neighbor. Oh, so tell me about that jewelry. Where did you get it? During the flight, they watched movies on the screen. They checked their messages. Some of them slept. If you were blessed to be in first class, you ate lobster and drank sparkling wine. If you were in economy in the back by the toilet, you had to hold your nose for the odor. Hey. But whether you were in first class or last class, whether you played games or slept, whether you ate and drank or simply watched movies, everybody ended up at the same place they started. <laughs> Nobody was better off. And that's how life is. No matter how you enjoy this life, I'm living in East Legon. I got a visa to US. I've been promoted to chairman. I've got money, I've got this. You will end up where you started because we came to this world naked and empty and we will all leave naked and empty. Everything you're chasing in this life will fade, but Jesus lasts forever. That's why Job 8.13 says, such is the hopeless future of all who turn from God. And I'm here to tell you today, stop giving people hope in this world. Give them hope in Jesus. Don't just tempt them with a better life. Give them eternal life, for we are here to be a witness of his glory. He's the hope of the world. He's our living hope. He'll be with you in prison and with you in the palace. He'll be with you as a single and with you as a married. Jesus Christ gives meaning and purpose to life. Somebody say amen. amen. Only Jesus can forgive sin. Only Jesus can heal a broken heart. Only Jesus can give you peace that passes understanding. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul and give your life purpose and meaning. Only Jesus can save. For Acts 4.12 says, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. That's why we must not stop preaching Jesus. We must keep preaching Jesus. We must point people to Jesus. Where are the witnesses of Jesus? Where are the witnesses of his power? Where are the witnesses who point people to love the Lord and to be blessed by the Lord and to be saved by the Lord and to know the Lord for he's everything to us. So let me ask you a question today. Are you preaching Jesus? Or are you just preaching the benefits he gives? Are you offering the world eternal hope and eternal light? Or are you just offering them miracles without commitment and blessings without repentance? Make no mistake, a packed auditorium does not mean you have revival. You can fill an auditorium with enthusiastic people who sing and dance. So can Shatawale. You can fill an auditorium with people who wave their hankies and cheer. So can black stars. Entertainers, athletes, Political figures can fill places with people shouting and screaming, but revival centers around Jesus. <laughs> revival is not about a man of God. Revival is not an event. You see some churches, three-day revival. Revival ends on Friday. Revival ends on Friday. If it's revival, it doesn't end. Tell your neighbor he's talking about you. One time, many years ago, I was in Sapele, Nigeria. I was a missionary in Sapele, Nigeria. Anybody heard of Sapele? Any Orobos in the house? God bless you. Do, wado, wado, wado. I was in Sapele. Unbeknownst to themselves, two different evangelists decide to hold open air crusade at the same time, on the same night, at the same primary school. Hey. The first one got there, set up his platform, set up his instrument. And before he knew, he looked across. The other man came. The other man came and saw the one setting up. He said, I'm going to the other side of the field he set up. 
Hey, the two were now ready to do it out. Who could get more people? So the first man put up a film show. When the people came, everybody went to the side where the film show. Hey, the other man was crying. This man was laughing. I have more people. Hey. But when the film show ended, the second man said, hey, I have a trick too. He put up a film show. Everybody moved to the other side of the field. What's the film show? This man was laughing. This man was crying. Hey. But not to be outdone, the second man got a second film show. When this one finished, he put up a third film show. Everybody moved back to the other side. Why can't we just meet and say, oh, I didn't know you were here. Let's work together. Let's work together. Let's work together. Who are you competing with? Who are you fighting? If it's souls, let them come. To, are they coming to Jesus or are they coming to you? Are they coming to Jesus? Are they coming to your church? Are they coming to Jesus? Because if someone gets saved, God bless them wherever they go. Let God bless them and fill them and use them and teach them and grow them. If it's agape, great. If it's assemblies, great. If it's Baptist, so what? Are you preaching Jesus? Are you preaching yourself? Hmm. My ministry. I'm anointed. Some of you live to have your picture on the billboard. Hey, hey my picture on the billboard. You're not that handsome, please. Please, I beg, some of you, if you put your picture there, you would drive people. <laughs> hey. Some of you, people come to the altar, all you want is them to fall down. You think if they fall down, if they fall down, if they fall down, if they fall down, fall down, they fall down and come back the same. They've not been touched by God. If they fall down and they are not changed, it's not God. Maybe you push them. You know why some of them fall down? You didn't brush your teeth. You're shouting loose and they're like, oh my God. They're trying to escape your bad breath. That's why they fall down. Did I offend you? I beg, oh, forgive me, Mpacho, Mpacho, forgive me, oh. I will go now, I will go now, bye bye. You say, I want you to be my daddy. Don't you know daddies will discipline you? You're not looking for a daddy, you're looking for a sugar daddy. If you want a daddy, expect to be paddled because sometime daddy will come and say, stop it. Jesus is the reason for revival. Jesus is what we're preaching. Jesus is the reason we can sing in the prison at midnight. Jesus is the reason we can rejoice in the face of persecution. One day, there will be no prison, but there will always be Jesus. One day, there will be no midnight, but there will always be Jesus. And today, the church needs to come back to Jesus and Jesus alone. The reason for our faith is Jesus. And we're called to be a witness to Jesus. And when we do, the world will change. That's our third truth today. Revolutionary results occur when we become ablaze. Turn to your back page. Listen to verse 26 and 28. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Can somebody say hallelujah? The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. If you're here today, shout, we are all here. And think about what is happening. The fervent 
faith of Paul and Silas expressed in their prayer and praise had a dramatic result. The fact that they kept themselves ablaze in the dungeon brought revival. As their praises rose to God, suddenly the walls began to shake. As they began singing a hymn of hope, suddenly light pierced the darkness. The shackles broke off and the doors were opened because God uses our song of praise rising at midnight to shatter shackles and demolish dungeons. But it wasn't just Paul and Silas who were impacted by this earth-shaking visitation of God. Every prisoner was also impacted. Every prisoner heard the hymn of hope at midnight. Every prisoner witnessed the revolutionary results of Paul and Silas being ablaze. And every prisoner felt the power and presence of God. For you see, the most remarkable miracle in this story is not that the prison doors opened. The most remarkable miracle is not that the shackles were broken. The most remarkable, amazing miracle in this story is that when the shackles were broken and the doors were opened, not one single prisoner left. What? Criminals. Thieves, murderers, their shackles are broken, the doors are open, they could have gotten up and run away, but they all stayed. Why? 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 The prisoners were so impacted by the presence of God, they refused to leave the prison. Listen, listen. They would rather be prisoners in the presence of God than outside the prison without God. When you experience revival, when you get ablaze, people would rather be with you in the village than without Jesus in New York City. People would rather be with Jesus wherever he leads them than in the nicest mansion without him. For our godly response to the trials of this life releases the fiery presence of God that draws men and women to us. When we live in the reality that now is the right time and Jesus is the reason, we can have confident hope that revolutionary results will occur when we get set ablaze. That's why Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1.13, put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. He's all we need. He's all we have to offer. He's everything. That's the lesson I learned back in 1981. I was a missionary in southern Nigeria. I've been called to go and preach in a place called Otujeremi. So I went to Otujeremi, we held an open air crusade. One night a woman came forward and gave her life to Christ. She gave her life to Christ and after the service she said, I have idols in my home, I want you to come and burn them. Now she had come from another small village about a few kilometers away. So we said we're coming next morning. Saturday morning we got up, we got on our motorbike, we went down the dirt road from Otujeremi to this woman's village. When we got there, it was a very small village, about 50 huts, mud huts with that roof. When I came down from the motorcycle, everybody came out to stare at Oibo Obruni. One small, small boy, about three years old, he looked at me. First time he's seen a white man, he started screaming, ah! We said, look at all these people coming to stare at Obruni. Let's use this opportunity to preach. So we gathered the people. We said, Madame, where can we meet? She said, come to my house. We got to the house. We sat down. The place was packed. People were standing outside. I started preaching. Those days, I didn't speak Urubo, so I, I had to use interpreter. I was preaching, interpreter was preaching, I was preaching, the interpreter was translating, I was preaching, I was getting to the end of my sermon. I could feel the presence of God. I said, I'm going to give an altar call. And all of a sudden, as I was preaching, an old fat man, half naked, stood up in the back and started shouting. He interrupted my sermon. Hey! Nobis Martino. Now, wow. He had never been to church, so he didn't know you don't interrupt the preacher. He started shouting in his language, Rubo. Then, before I knew it, other people in the room started shouting, hey, 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 hey. 
they were fighting. It's like a riot. I kept trying to tell the interpreter, tell me what's happening, what's happening. But he, he, every time he turned to tell me, the man started shouting again. I'll be honest, I was backing up, speaking in tongues. <laughs> I didn't know what was happening. I thought, oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to die in O2 Jeremy. Hey, Jesus. I was looking for exit. There was no door out of the room except right behind this big fat man. Hey. People are shouting. It's getting tense. I'm looking for exit. I'm the only O'Bruni with 100 miles. Oh my God. I was about to make a break and run outside. And the interpreter said, just a minute, it's okay, it's okay, it's scary. And when I heard what the man said, I was shocked. You'll be shocked too. The interpreter said, this is what the man is saying. All my life, I've been an idol worshiper. I practiced what our ancestors taught us. I've made sacrifices. But in all my life, I have never had one single answer to prayer. If the Jesus, this white man is talking about, is really God, I want to follow him. I want to follow him. Other people were shouting, no, no, you're dishonoring the gods. He said, no, they don't answer my prayer. I want Jesus. Then he came to the front and took me by the hand and led me out the room. I thought the interpreter would follow. He didn't come with me. This man is taking me down the path, down the path. I'm like, oh, Jesus, have mercy. He takes me to his room, goes under the bed, pulls out a box filled with charms and fetish and chalk, handed to me. <laughs> Went up on the shelf, got a box of idols and occult, gave it to me. Take it, take it. We went back and we took it. We added the other woman's idols. We burnt them with fire and we stood around and sang, there's power, power, wonder-working power. Power in the blood of Jesus. A church was started in that village. That man served God. And I left there changed. Remember walking down the road outside the village, thinking, hey, I'm powerful. Did you see how anointed I was? Never mind, I was shaking before. <laughs> there. Me, anointed, anointed missionary. Hey. <laughs> Nigeria, look out. God tapped me on the shoulder, so the Holy Spirit said, excuse me, excuse me. It wasn't you. It wasn't you. You're not that great. Don't you know I've been preparing him for 20 years? Don't you know I've been speaking to him, calling to him? He wanted me, but there was no witness. There was no witness. How long had he been waiting? How long had he been hoping? How long had he been hungry for Jesus? But there was no witness. And on that road outside of Tujeremi, I lifted up my hands and said, Lord, here am I. Send me. I may not be the greatest preacher. I may not have all the gifts, but I'm an empty vessel. Fill me, use me, set me ablaze for your purpose. So I joined the chorus of the hymn of hope at midnight. I added my voice to Paul and Silas and I started singing praises to my God and other people joined in from all around Nigeria and from Ghana and Liberia and Sierra Leone and Zambia and Tanzania and South Sudan. We're raising our voices. I may not sing the best, but I will do my best. I may not always stay in tune, but I will stay the course. I will sing the hymn of hope at midnight that everyone around me will hear and everyone will know Jesus saves, Jesus heals, Jesus is in us. Today there are thousands of villages right in Ghana, no church, no witness.
There are millions of souls who don't know the name of Jesus right here in our nation. If they could hear, if they could hope, if they could meet Jesus. But how can they hear if no one goes? How can they believe on someone they don't know of? For Romans 10 says, how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless you tell them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? Send me, Jesus. Send me to be ablaze. Send me to sing the hymn of hope at midnight. I'm here today to invite you to join me. I'm here today to invite you to join the choir and sing along. I'm here today to ask you to add your voice to the hymn of hope at midnight. For when we sing that song of praise in the midnight, in the dungeon, the earth begins to shake. The heavens get opened. Revival comes when we get set ablaze. So add your voice to the voice of those who've been rescued. Add your voice to the voice of Samuel from Sawaliga. Add your voice to the voice of Janelle Guzman and tell them God gives eternal life. Add your voice to the voice of the man from Otujeremi and tell people hope has come. Let the music swell. Let our voices rise. Let our prayers be heard. Let our love be seen. Let our focus be eternal. Let our faith be unwavering. For now is the time to be ablaze. And Jesus is the reason to be ablaze. And we will see revival when we become ablaze. Father, in the name of Jesus, move in us, Lord. Change us today. I pray you'll stir us and shake us. Would you stand to your feet right now all across this room? If you want to come to the altar and pray, you're welcome to come. We're dedicating ourselves to Christ right now. We're dedicating ourselves to the Lord. We're thanking him right now for his presence. We're thanking him for his grace. We're thanking him for his power. We're thanking him. Say, let me be ablaze. Let me be ablaze. I loose a new vision upon you today. I open your eyes in the spirit to see new visions from God. I loose a new vision, a new call, a new sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. I loose it upon you now. Receive, receive, receive. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Father, I pray you open new doors. Yes, Lord Let the prison walls shake. Yes, Let the Lord. shackles be released. Yes, Let the Lord. doors fly open. Let your presence be so strong, yes. O oh God, that people come from the north, the south, and the east, and the west to seek you, to receive you. Let revival be born, O oh God. Yes. Let it be birthed in us, yes, that it might be birthed in our nation. Yes, Move Lord. in us. Yes. Set us ablaze, yes, Lord. Lord. Not for our sake, not for our ministry, not for our church, yes. but for you, Jesus, that yes. you will be exalted, that yes. there will be a witness yes. in every village, yes. in every town, to every person. Yes. Lord, we dare not fail you. We dare not fail you. We dare not fail you. You died for us. Yes. We offer our lives for you yes. in surrender. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.